All right, hello and welcome. Pastor John here, and I uh, just want to welcome you to the last part of the Christian Basics series, um, which is the Doctrine of the Last Things. All right, <clears throat> we had covered all the other uh, main Christian doctrines, and so here we are, uh, literally, this is uh, the last part and the last things. So um, let's, have a, let's have a look at uh, what um, all this is about. Um, the last things in, <clears throat> in um, Christian eschatology is like basically um, a um, reference to the uh, second coming of Jesus Christ, in other words, Judgment Day. So um, that's one of the things we want to keep in mind as, as we'd followed along and uh, we had understood um, the Bible is all about Jesus. It points us to Jesus Christ and who he is and uh, um, why he came, right? Jesus Christ, who he is as God in the flesh and why he came to atone for our sins. So here in this last part, <coughs> we're going to be um, looking at um, the main parts, um, basically relating to um, um, Christian eschatology, or also known the doctrine of the last things, or teaching of the last things. All right, get ready. Here we go. So, Jesus tells us, when everything is ready, I will come and get you, so that you will always be with me where I am. God bless me, our last word. John 14, 3. I'll read it one more time. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. God bless me, our last word. So <clears throat> in this uh, verse here, um, our Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ promises us that he will um, come uh, on Judgment Day, um, as he returns the second time um, to um, to be with us, uh, that we can be with him forever, and that is in heaven with Jesus for all eternity. All right, so that's pretty much um, what this verse is about, and this is Jesus's promise. And um, so again, um, the um, uh, this revelation, this this promise of Jesus, is unique. And it's only found in the Bible, and um, um, it shows us of um, the trustworthiness and the the unconditional, unconditional divine joy and love um, that we as believers um, already can experience in the here and now, uh, as we prepare um, as for this uh, final encounter in the uh, in uh, Jesus' eternal glory in the heavenly kingdom. So in heaven. So what do we mean by eschatology? There's two Greek words here. Eschatos means last and logos is study of. So eschatology, the study of the last things. So that's as, you know, as, as much theology we're going to put in there, verse, uh, um, words, terminology. And so the last things is uh, learning about Jesus' second coming uh, and what that means. So sometimes the, this doctrine, is, the doctrine of the last things, is also known as the doctrine of the future um, or the doctrine of the end times or simply the study of the last things. But here's a big one right, right here from the get-go. So as we get into this eschatology um, from a biblical perspective, even though it talks about future events, um, we're not supposed to engage in um, fortune telling or you know looking for the signs to predict when Jesus comes. Uh, that is prohibited. The Bible tells us uh, not to do that. It commands us uh, not to, and <clears throat> because um, as I, in the in the article, I have uh, many many different uh, specific commands that Jesus gives us. Uh, especially from the Old Testament to and um, not to look out for or try to predict, uh, not to not, not to predict fortune tell when Jesus is coming back. 
Jesus warns us of that himself. I'll give you one. Um, you can read more in the article that I've prepared for you again. It's Matthew 24, uh, 36, and Matthew 24, 38 to 44. And uh, so it's not about fortune telling the end times, even though it deals with future events. So then, so what is this doctrine about? Right? So it is about Jesus, and more specifically, about our personal relationship with him as believers and especially what he wants to accomplish in and through us. So um, as we see uh, the, um, as you see all these parts fit together now, um, God in his grace has given us a complete overview from Genesis and the Old Testament uh, uh, as, as to the first arrival of our Lord Jesus, the birth and incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ, um, his death, resurrection, and ascension, and sending us the Holy Spirit, everything we need to know about the Christian life and actually live uh, the Christian life uh, in and through Jesus, or actually better to say, let Jesus live his life in and through us. That's a better way of saying it. So that's pretty much it, and only in the Bible do we find God's um, divinely sovereign, perfect plan and his perfect purpose and timing um, for every believer. So um, the doctrine of the end times is really a, a call for us as believers to, to persevere, right, until Jesus returns, whenever that is. So while we, so one of the goals we want to do here or think about is uh, instead of doing fortune telling, which we're uh, warned not to do, the Bible warns us, and Jesus does too, is to focus what the Bible does tell us what we need to know. And it tells us a lot about the end times, especially heaven and hell, right? And so we're going to be talking about that. Um, we've encountered different spiritual realities that we're dealing with as believers. Um, you know, sin, Satan, death. As you remember, you followed along the other um, passages, um, other segments, the other doctrines, and see how it all fits together, right? God in his grace and mercy and love for us, has not left us in the dark, so to say. So there's so much in the Bible um, that is revealed to us. So um, usually the... So we're going to look at different parts, right, um, that, that had have to do with the, uh, with the end times. So one is the uh, return of Christ. So, so what does the Bible... What does the Bible tell us about Christ's return? Um, we call Christ's second coming uh, parousia. So what that means is basically um, the second coming of Christ um, happens or takes place. It is abrupt. It is personal. It is personal and visible. And it's a bodily return. So as we learn from Acts 1.11, uh, uh, we are told that Jesus uh, will return um, the way he ascended to heaven. The Bible tells us that. Really amazing. So we know the, um, the how, but we don't know the when, right? So that's important that, the, um, uh, that we don't focus on that. And again, a big one right there too. If any person says, right, that they know or that they can't predict or whatever when Christ returns, um, they're wrong. It's false. Uh, it's it's not uh, um, God's will. Um, those are false, unfortunately, false teachers. We have to pray for people to repent from those sins. But it's by default wrong because the Bible tells us um, that um, um, we're not supposed to know when uh, Jesus returns. So, as much as we may be fascinated with the future and predicting the future, um, the Bible warns us. And, and one of the reasons is that uh, what the Bible does tell us is that there is an imminent return. In other words, Christ Jesus could come at any time. right? And so we have to be prepared as, um, as believers, as Christians, right? And so there's, a, there's an urgency, and there's many, many, many more verses um, in the article that is there. I've prepared that for you to take a look. 
Um, so in other words, we have to, um, the calling is to live as if Christ can and, and will, and the Bible tells us, can come at any moment in time. We just don't know when. So, so what the Bible does tell us is that um, one of the reasons is that um, we want to focus on Jesus, right? And we've got God-given work. We've got uh, the Christian life, which is not always so easy. It's actually, you know, maybe not so um, romantic or, uh, you know, awesome as it is portrayed. It is, a, it is a long journey and it's challenging. And there's a whole lot of um, uh, difficulties, right? So um, there are there are obstacles in the way. So it is only through the Holy Spirit that we can fulfill uh, the Great Commission, as we um, looked at last time in the the doctrine of the Church, right? In Matthew twenty eight sixteen to twenty. So so we've got God, God's given work to do here. Tell others about uh, Jesus and. So Jesus wants us to focus on him and also grow uh, in a personal relationship with Jesus and other people too, through, um, through an open Bible, ideally. So um, one, okay, so um, one part is called the uh, millennium uh, that deals with eschatology, so the thousand years. In Revelation chapter 20, 1 to 10, we read, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. God bless the reading of his word. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Revelation chapter 20 verse 4. God bless the reading of his word. So the question here is then basically um, how are we going to take, how, how do we take, understand the statement as the Bible reveals uh, to us? Is it literal or symbolic uh, or um both cannot be both, is it both? Um, but however we respond, if we just stick with literal or symbolic, so um, we um, that will determine what kind of view we take. And I'm going to say one or two more things about the view we hold to uh, what it may be um, and why it is, um, uh, the, um, it, it is secondary to the... Um, uh, to our Lord's call and mission. Uh, I'll explain that briefly. So the thousand years is the millennium is, is from the Latin mille, which means a uh, thousand, one thousand. So there's three main views um, that exist. Um, uh, they're called, basically called amillennialism, postmillennialism, and premillennialism. I'm not going to expand on all of these. They're in the article. I want you to read them. But they are um, important to understand uh, what different positions there are. Um, and again, they're all within um, Christian orthodoxy. In other words, they're all biblically acceptable. While they may not be all, uh, you know, right? It could, because we're dealing with the future, we just don't know which is the right one. But again, um, it, it depends on how views on uh, this biblical prophecy is interpreted, right? So um, look at the article, and uh, there's also a little bit more. There's a little dis discussion for you to consider in, um, in, the, in, in the Appendix A in the article that you can access on the link to Scripture. Okay, so um, take a short break here. We'll Pause for a moment, and then we'll go get into the thing that's things that really that matter most um, uh, about this doctrine. Okay. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Let us read here in the Bible um, what the Bible tells us about the final judgment. It's very important. So we'll read carefully here. The Bible tells us, And I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it. The earth and sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. 
I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead, and death and the grave gave up their dead, and all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death, and anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. God bless the reading of his word. This is Revelation chapter 20, 11 to 15 from the NLT um, paraphrase. So this is a very um, stern and firm um, a word of uh, admonishment, but also encouragement to understand what the final judgment is about and the, what the Bible tells us about this, right? So this is when there will be a, um, um, there's a God rewards um, uh, people who are righteous as believers and punishes the unrighteous unbelievers. That's in Second Peter chapter 2, verses 9 to 10. So what that means is um, believers and unbelievers. So, so uh, believers are people who, um, who have uh, accepted Jesus Christ in repentance as their personal Lord and Savior. And the unrighteous unbelievers are those who have denied Jesus Christ as God in the flesh and not followed him. Uh, the judgment for all of this is related to us by Jesus himself already in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, 16 to 21, if you want to revisit that one. So, there will be, uh, Jesus Christ will be the judge on Judgment Day, whenever it is. There is one final judgment, and Jesus Christ will be the judge. And um, so for us, for I mean, as Christians, as believers, there's some kind of a unspecified reward. Uh, but whatever that is, um, it's in 2 Corinthians 5.10, that's not what we're aiming for, because our job is to uh, serve our Lord Jesus Christ in the best way we can as the Holy Spirit guides and leads us. All right, so we're not looking uh, for uh, uh, whatever that reward is. Um, more importantly is that unbelievers will be eternally separated from God in hell. Unbelievers will be eternally separated from God in hell. Take this to heart. This is a very important and stern um, warning. And um, there is no um, second chance. I'm going to say one or two more things here about that. But um, it's, it's at the final judgment. Um, God's justice will be complete. And um, there's um, really uh, nothing else that can be said or done at that moment or that event in time right on judgment day so in other words there's no second chance to repent there's no uh, opportunity to appeal for clemency i've added the bible verses in the article right when it says destruction of the ungodly um, that does not mean i repeat that does not mean that people cease to exist or they as some form of annihilation, like they like people dissolve into some particles or something. No, um, uh, that is a false teaching. Annihilationism is a false teaching, and um, uh, Jesus makes it plain that there is a um, there's a judgment, and then as a result of that judgment, a separation between believers and unbelievers. All right. All right, here comes another big one. It's, it's called eternal punishment. So it is so important uh, for us to learn about the outcome that a decision a person makes for or against Christ. Um, so we're going to be looking a bit more at the consequences of for those who reject Jesus. All right? Unfortunately, the Bible tells us that there will be those um, who reject Jesus and... Uh, no, it doesn't mean either that uh, uh, God loves all people and because I'm a person, uh, I will be, be uh, because God loves all people, everybody goes to heaven. And uh, uh, because I'm a person, I'm going to go to heaven, therefore. 
the Bible doesn't tell us that uh, at all. So that's false. Um, the understanding is, and uh, for um, anybody who rejects Jesus, is uh, the result is eternal punishment. So uh, this is what we call the um, reality and the doctrine of hell. So being eternally separated from God, um, namely uh, eternal punishment, um, shows us uh, hell is real, it is true, and the Bible tells us it is. I repeat that. Hell is real, it is true, and the Bible tells us it is. Um, uh, one of the reasons we know that is because God is perfect, and he's a perfect judge, and he is holy and just. In other words, he cannot um, um, accept anything uh, evil or anything evil um, what is of the devil or, or or sin which is unrepentant into his eternal presence right that's why um, people who um, deny jesus fall under god's uh, eternal wrath and that's why jesus on the cross atoned for our sins to um, as god placed him under god's under his own wrath uh, um, to um, to make it to atone for our sins that that wrath doesn't fall on us and we who place our belief and faith in jesus right so as we are saved eternally saved so that's a very important one in the book of romans in chapter one we see um that there's no excuse uh, for anyone who rejects god because god has um uh, clearly revealed himself in his creation through uh, nature, through the universe, and th uh, through people. Uh, and so that's just a general revelation. And the special revelation is uh, through our Lord Jesus Christ, um, through his atoning wor uh, work and uh, the Bible. All right? So there's no excuse, uh, unfortunately, or that's just the way the Bible tells us it is. So something we want to keep in mind. So also note um, sometimes you may have heard something called, some people say, uh, uh, well, what about purgatory? Well, there is no such thing as purgatory. Um, like the idea of, a, it's a man-made belief of like a pre-admittance place, right? pre-admittance for believers' souls um, that they can regain uh, purification from sin before being admitted to heaven. Um, that's simply not true. The Bible does not teach us that at all. Right? That's Hebrews 9.27, and so it, it doesn't exist. So either, either we believe in Jesus, follow him, and uh, enter as believers uh, eternal, uh, his eternal um, presence in heaven, or uh, we deny, or people deny, hopefully not, Jesus has God in the flesh, and are eternally separated from God in hell. That's it. There's no in-between. So... Um, it's a for, that is so purgatory is a false man-made idea why do some people teach this god only knows all right so um, um but it's false okay so keep in mind but given the reality of eternal punishment we must ve take seriously jesus's teaching on the nature of hell as a real place and as a reality hell is a real place and it is a reality so um the um it is frightening i mean it is something we you know we but we have to teach and preach this as followers of jesus if not we're not fulfilling the great commission and we're just giving an incomplete picture so it, jesus himself in his grace mercy and love provides the frightening reality of hell right to help us understand um that um when we are or, or those who deny jesus as god in the flesh are eternally separated from god so it means conscious, physical, eternal punishment, suffering for all people who die without Christ. Infinite punishment is exactly that. Uh, it's infinite, never-ending, eternal. So it's just something we just don't want to get that wrong, right? But we want to tell other people and warn other people about that too, right? So that's why we're taking a little more closer look at this. And again... Um, do read the article 
and to help you and look up those Bible verses, see how it all fits together. And um, this is such an important doctrine, right? We don't want to be, nobody um, wants to be eternally separated or, you know, hopefully not to be separated from Jesus Christ for all eternity in hell. So, um, yeah, that's a choice for us to turn to Jesus while there's still time. And uh, in His grace and mercy, um, He has provided a way for any person, a any person who will turn to Him uh, with repentant, humble, sinner's heart, uh, to be uh, come to Him, enter a personal issue with Him in faith, in Christ, in Christ's work, what He did on the cross, is fully completed um, work on the cross and enter a personal relationship and be eternally saved, uh, sealed through the person power of the Holy Spirit. And so the, um, a person's salvation cannot be lost uh, based on all of that too. So let's take a little breather here. Just pause for a moment, right? Um, there's a lot we have to deal with. So short break here. Okay, you ready? Yeah. So next up is um, death and the intermediate state. So basically, um, what happens when we die? I mean, it's a reality we all have, all of us have to face. And Hebrews nine twenty seven, um, um, you, me, everybody, we have to die, and um, that's part, part of um, um, our. Uh, the outcome of the fall of mankind. Remember the doctrine of the fall, if you followed along, where sin and death becomes a reality? So, interestingly enough, it is only, and this is really interesting, only in the Bible that we have a coherent, a fully coherent, cohesive view on life, death, and eternity. All right? Remember, we in another part we had said, the only the Bible... Um, once you come to Jesus and you open the Bible and you read it and, and, and study it and learn and grow, only the Bible is the only, if you just want to very simply call it text, um, we call it God's given, God's word, but that um, helps us understand and answer these questions. Where do I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? Where do I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? It's only the Bible that can that provides that um, cohesive answer, and um, um, so it's a it's very very blessed that God has revealed Himself in and through the Bible, right? So it's a, that's one of the things that sets the Bible apart from. All other, you know, faiths, I mean, there's man-made texts and belief systems, but, I mean, if you look at it, you know, we'll pray for everybody, right? We'll pray for everybody to repent, no no judgment, we're not judging anybody, but Jesus will judge, right? So since the Bible is God-made and God-given, um, you know, we better, you know, open it up and not just be willing to open it, but read and embrace the absolute truth that it provides, right? So as I said, anyone can receive uh, Christ as their per personal Lord and Savior. So I just mentioned, we just mentioned the intermediate state. What do we mean by the intermediate state? So the Bible tells us that the intermediate state is uh, sometimes um, referred to as the intermediate heaven. Right? Because Jesus has not returned the second time yet. It could happen at any moment. God only knows when. But um, th this is where uh, the Bible reveals to us what the intermediate heaven is. Right? And it's revealed to us by Jesus himself. And we can see this in uh, Luke uh, chapter 23, verse 43. And I'll read it. So 
Um, as Jesus is crucified, as the Roman soldiers had uh, uh, placed him, nailed him uh, to the cross to die a horrendous, terrible death, there's two other um, people um, crucified with him. Um, we are told they were criminals, uh, thieves, the one on the left and one on the right. And um, in the, in the uh, progress of events, there is um, uh, um, an indication, a hint, at the intermediate heaven, so, which Jesus himself reveals to us. Um, but here again, I'm just going to read it to you. Here's the verse. Then the thief said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. God bless you know, his word. So it is in this verse that Jesus reveals to himself the, uh, the truth and the reality of the intermediate heaven that is the promise he makes to the repentant thief who's lying next to him on the cross. Well, in the beginning, as you read the Gospels, um, it appears they're both mocking Jesus, right? Um, if you are the Son of God, like in this, you know, help us down here or call an angel army or whatever it is, right? It appears they're mocking him. But um, one thief has a change of heart. And this is a really, really big point, very important. He's repentant. So what that means is he, he repents. He turns to Jesus literally at the last moment. Um, the other, the other, other person doesn't, but this thief does. And Jesus acknowledges, he sees the, this, this man's heart as he's dying, and he, he accepts um, him into paradise, uh, the, the intermediate heaven. It's really, really amazing. Wow, that was really the last chance there. I encourage you, it's Luke, Gospel of Luke 23, 43, and that's really the last moment for repentance, and um, I pray hopefully not for anybody else, right? But often that's the that's the case too. As God's grace, right? The people come to Jesus in the last moment. They, they, they heard about the gospel, they know about the gospel, and they may be dying, and That's the last chance. So the truth is then, as we see here, um, because Jesus sees uh, repentant hearts, Jesus accepts every repentant sinner. All right? So that's that's basically the bottom line, and that's what we call the intermediate state. So well, the Bible does not fully reveal um, what that means, huh? the intermediate state or the intermediate, intermediate body, <coughs> whatever you want to call it, means... There's more than enough that we can learn about what God does want us to know. And um, there's another event I want to point to you, and that's um, the event called the Transfiguration. And at the Transfiguration, both the um, uh, God's servants Moses and Elijah from the Old Testament come into sight um, to both the, the apostles who are there, Peter, James, and John at that event, and uh, witness Christ communicating with them. And God again shows up and speaks. This is my dearly beloved son. Listen to him. Right? So this is again a verification. It's in Matthew 17, 3 to 4, and Luke 9, 28 to 35. A verification of Jesus' divinity and as Messiah. And it also shows us. Uh, the reality of having um, uniquely, like, uh, unique distinctive bodies, uh, if you want to call it intermediate bodies, before the parousia, so Jesus' second coming. So what does that all mean? Right? There's a lot to, uh, to uh, think about and to pray about here, right? It means that death is not the end of existence, right? But it's like a movement, a continuation from one state to another. So, um... God does give us a glimpse of heaven right here and um, also uh, in the book of Revelation 2, chapter 6, 10 to 11, uh, the tribulation saints, right, people who are uh, given physical robes, right, so it's 
very, very amazing what the Bible does reveal us about the intermediate state. Um, the bottom line is, um, death remains uh, the final enemy who will be subdued by Christ. All right. 1 Corinthians 15, 54. Death is swallowed up in victory. God bless the universe word. So while Jesus, through the resurrection, already conquered death, um, it is until the consummation, the second coming of Jesus, um, it is still a reality we have to, all human beings have to deal with. So, all right. So now let us look at the, um, the resurrection. We had mentioned the resurrection. And um, it is the most important part of Christianity, the Christian faith. Um, um, without without the resurrection, um, there would be no uh, Christianity, right? Risen Lord. So, I read from the Bible. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will go and get him. Mary, Jesus said to her. Mary, Jesus said. She turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. God bless you, that's John 20, um, verses 14 to 16. So here is... Um, Mary, uh, Mary Magdalene, Mary of Magdala, and she's the first uh, eyewitness to the resurrection, and uh, she doesn't recognize Jesus for whatever reason. The Bible doesn't tell us, but she recognizes like his physical appearance, but she recognizes his voice. So it is really astonishing, and um, so he's physically risen after the crucifixion, after. Um, having been placed in tomb for three days. And so this is the core of the Christian faith, right? The truth, the promise, and the purpose of the resurrection. So resurrection is basically means to rise again, right? We, or we can also say standing up. So um, there are many different passages which we're not going to read. But um, again, sometimes Jesus reveals himself in a certain way, the, in, um, um, after the resurrection event, after this re event we just read, the first time he appears to, um, to the first uh, eyewitness, Mary, here. And so um, there's many different appearances. Um, he, um, the Bible uh, shows us that there's many different instances and many different circumstances under which Jesus uh, reveals himself. And there's, uh, oh, there's so many and I encourage you to go into the article and have a look and read them um, all yourself, right? They're all in the article. So what does that mean for us? So Jesus is the first to be resurrected. So it's, it's, it's something to think about. There's a transformation that happens um, at the resurrection. So um, again, big one, right? This is, a, a, this is a mandatory doctrine, Christian doctrine, that must be affirmed. Um, the doctrine of the resurrection that we accept it into our heart by faith and uh, with, without this uh, doctrine we are removed uh, from the Christian faith uh, some man-made faith then but not Christianity it, even bigger um, if we or, or, or anyone else or anybody may say uh, we are believers and that it is true followers of Christ Christians we must affirm the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Keep that in mind. So we must affirm the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. All right. So we um, have to understand, though, that um, not everything is told to us about the resurrection. God wants it to be so um, because um, we have more than enough that he wants us to know in the Bible. And... Um, Right? I mean, there's somebody, like somebody may say, um, you can't prove the resurrection. Well, do I need to prove, or does anybody need to prove the resurrection? No, because God has proven himself in and through the resurrection. Hmm. All right. Um, 
Yeah, I require a specific proof. I require this proof or that proof to believe in the resurrection. Well, somebody then asks, well, what proof would be sufficient for you to, uh, to believe in the resurrection? Right? And then people can come up with all kinds of different things. And um, it's just, uh, you know, it just doesn't work that way, right? Because, um, again, the Bible reveals more than enough. Uh, that God wants us to know. And we have to have a little uh, room for faith too, right? I mean, it's not like, you know, like when a baby is born, that there's like a little tag attached to the baby's feet. And then it says, and this is how you have eternal salvation. Believe in Jesus Christ, uh, you know, accept him as your personal Lord and Savior, repent, and uh, you're eternally saved. It just doesn't work that way, right? So there has to be a little room for faith and belief too, right? Um, uh, so it's just one of one of those things to consider um, along those lines. So the foundational, the the main biblical passages on the resurrection, since we're still talking about the resurrection, are in um, one Corinthians chapter fifteen, and um, this is very important. If if you read it, when you read the entire chapter. Uh, of Paul's letter, first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, um, Paul helps us understand the importance of our Lord's resurrection, um, especially that it is God, right, who guarantees and secures our immortality as believers. It's nothing of our own doing, nothing through good deeds or being a good person or whatever, apart from Christ, nothing that can make a, bring us into right standing uh, with God. Very, very important. So it is in these passages here uh, that we uh, see God's guarantee and that he secures um, our immortality as believers, we who, be as Christians, we believe in Jesus Christ. So um, again, there is a resurrection and um, there is good indication in the Bible that it applies to both believers and unbelievers, as said. Please read Acts twenty four fifteen, and uh, Revelation twenty verses five to six. It's very important. Um, the uh, The resurrection is a real event. Um, Christ has risen. Amen. All right. So the last thing we want to look at in this doctrine of eschatology, uh, doctrine of the last things, is what we call the new heavens and the new earth. Right? What does the Bible tell us about the new heavens and the new earth, like Eden restored? Right? See how it all fits together? So, uh, Jesus Christ's second coming, right? we see how everything comes together. Um, we see how Jesus, as uh, Lord and Savior, restores all things to himself. Right? This is the end of, the, end of history, when time ends, eternity begins, whatever exactly that means. It's called the consummation of the age. So it culminates at Christ's second coming, right? So that's at this, at this moment, at that uh, event, uh, is when the new heaven and the new earth uh, begins. So what happens then at that moment? So the Bible tells us there is a final judgment and God's eternal plan of salvation, uh, which is then... Um, as said, found in Revelation chapters 21 to 22. Um, that was part of the, you know, homework to read. So if you haven't read that up, I encourage you, read chapters 21, 22. The Bible tells us much, much more about the new heaven and the new earth that is um, heaven, in short, with Jesus Christ, right? So um, God, God's eternal kingdom, like his heavenly kingdom, is... Uh, thereby consummated through his return at Judgment Day, is revealed to all believers um, as the bride, right? We got the bride in the back of the church, which is all believers, and um, the bridegroom, so to say, is Christ. So the bride is the church, and the bridegroom is Christ, coming together in God's restored Eden uh, for all eternity. So that's it in a nutshell. And um, when you look at the um, the uh, promise that we have is that um, we will all, as believers, will live in God's presence forever. 
um, we find that present uh, that expressed in Matthew twenty five thirty four and Revelation twenty two three. So okay, but we talked about it. hell. What about what? What is heaven? Heaven is a real place, and it's not simply an idea. It's a place where we as believers, we enjoy the full presence of all holy God. And um, the, um, we can see God's glory expressed in uh, Revelation 21, uh, verses 24 20 to 26, and 22, verses 1 to 2. So what does that mean for us? Being, um, as believers, being in the presence of God... We enjoy unrestrained fellowship with him, that is Jesus. And that really is our call. That should be our mode. That should be a disposition of heart towards Jesus to motivate us to serve our Lord Jesus Christ faithfully, right? Um, that's Christ's call, right? And that motivates us um, to do our God-given work from the heart as the Holy Spirit guides and leads us. Not to gain anything or because we have to, right? Yes, we are supposed to do it, but not under compulsion, but because we want to. We want to share the good news with others. All right? Okay, so, as we're slowly coming to the end here, um, there's a final note here on the book of Revelation. Um, as I had said, uh, the book of Revelation is basically a letter, and it's written by the Apostle John, as Jesus instructs the Apostle John to write. Um written to the seven believers communities, the seven churches. You can read all about that in Revelation chapters 1 to 3. So what this is all about is basically an encouragement and a, and a warning. An encouragement and warning Jesus gives uh, in the midst of persecution and suffering um, to stay the course, to, uh, to follow Jesus, and not to um, compromise with uh, the world, uh, the enemy, uh, you know, the devil um, um, following idols, whatever else it is, um, but to stay focused with a heart bent towards Jesus. That's what Revelation is all about, pretty much. And uh, so, um, yeah, in the midst of persecution and suffering, right, um, Jesus uh, is helping us, encouraging us uh, to stay the course. And that's basically it. So we can ask, so... How does that apply to you and me, this, especially in the book of Revelation? So um, Jesus shows us that um, until he returns the second time, as we read in, in Revelation, so there's all kinds of persecution, pain, suffering, and evil that we as believers, as Christians, uh, encounter. Um, however, um, what is the, um, the encouragement is that Jesus cares about the believers then in those church communities in revelation and he cares about you and me he cares about us and he loves us jesus divinely loves us and calls us to trust him at all times and uh, to turn to him with repentant hearts um, it's not easy the christian walk of faith is challenging right and that is uh, what the what jesus and the bible basically tell us so however, we have hope as believers through the resurrection that as the at judgment day, then uh, we will be with Jesus in paradise, in heaven, and then there will be, no longer be any evil, sin, death, and Satan. Uh, why? Because um, Jesus will have separated himself and all Christians from all of that. Right. So in the meantime, um, evil, sin, death, and Satan are still... Um, part of our uh, earthly existence here until Jesus comes on Judgment Day, but then they will when he when he returns uh, they will be no more. So um, one more big one is really as we're awaiting the second coming of Christ, um, we want to be able to answer and make sure that we're uh, that our hearts are truly bent to Jesus, and so this one single question that we have to answer. And this question Jesus asks in, he asks his disciples in Matthew 16, 15, and says, Jesus asks, 
but who do you, but who do you say I am? But who do you say I am? And I pray, the prayer is that may our answer be that of Peter. The next verse, uh, you are the Messiah, the Son of the Living God. God bless you, God's word. All right. So that was a basic um, overview, a summary of the doctrine of the end times, with all the related parts. Um, wonderful. I, I, I hope this is the end of the uh, Christian Basics series. I hope um, you know it'll help you to follow along and, and grow, uh, learn more, understand who Jesus Christ is and why he came. And um, so, yeah, so there's a link to this article and all these materials, videos, articles, they're all created for you. Um, they're all placed, it's all public domain. Uh, you can share it, post it on your blog, website, whatever. No permission needed. And hopefully share it with others as well. All right. So, yeah, so that's that's basically it. Um, the goal is and and uh, for you to open the Bible, read, study it, uh, take to heart all of the things we had looked at and on a daily basis and uh, grow in your relationship with Jesus, right? That's why that is why God has given us his word and uh, uh, Jesus is uh, Jesus Christ um, is the word. So God has given us himself. Christ and revealed himself to us all and so here's one more verse here for encouragement the Bible promises your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path God bless you in this word that's Psalm 119 105 so God's word so yeah, so that's it. Uh, feel free to reach out on the blog. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, or whatever, um, God willing, I will be able to respond to you. And uh, in the meantime, um, you've got a good foundation here uh, about the Christian basics. So um, we'll end in prayer here. So Lord Jesus, we just want to thank you for um, this blessed day and that we were able to look at the doctrine of the end times, what you've revealed to us about um, Judgment Day, your second coming, uh, the importance of the resurrection, um, believing in you, um, the atonement you made, um, um, how you loved us so much that you went to the cross willingly through your free will, um, and that um, any person, any person can come to you. Well, that's the time we pray that the Holy Spirit touches people's hearts, softens people's hearts to receive you as their personal Lord and Savior in faith as they understand who you are, Lord Jesus, as God in the flesh and why you came to make atonement on the cross for our sins, that we, in, through, in faith through you, um, may have eternal life and be uh, eternally joined, sealed by the Holy Spirit, and um, already uh, living uh, in eternity with you, so to say, through the work and power of the Holy Spirit, uh, the person power of the Holy Spirit, and uh, all the encouragement you've given us, also about um, the new heavens and the new earth, and also warning us firmly and sternly that the decision we make um, uh, for or against you has eternal consequences and uh, that's what you've revealed to us uh, in the bible so we pray that everybody god willing comes to you with a repentant heart repentance is where it's all at and uh, turns to you while there's still time because there's no second opportunity there's no second chance to to um to come to you after death so thank you for all of this uh, thank you for blessing us we thank you for having revealed yourself in and through your word. And you are the word, Lord Jesus. And we thank you, love you, and praise you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. And always remember, the best Bible is an open Bible. May God bless you and keep you. Amen.